Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Melita Radisic. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto and a chair, uh, Canada Research Chair in Organ and Chip Engineering. I'm also a senior scientist at the Toronto General Research Institute. And it's really my great pleasure to announce this morning's session on engineering a healthier tomorrow. We'll start off by each of us showing you a few slides just to illustrate uh, our technologies a bit better. And our panelists today are Professor Jeff Karp. Uh, he had a family emergency, so he's going to present to us virtually. Our uh, next speaker after Professor Jeff Karp will be Professor Katya Schenker-Leland, and I'll invite her to join us on the stage. And then uh, Professor Peter Loskill uh, from the University of Tübingen. And then Professor Sabeth Verporte uh, from the University of uh, Groningen. So in the interest of time, I'll uh, start my presentation. So I'll spend the next uh, five to 10 minutes uh, talking about the latest developments on organoids and organoid chip as emerging technologies. And these are my quick disclosures. So what you can see here in this slide are various drugs. They have been all developed by different manufacturers. They are used for different indications, but they all have one thing in common. And the commonality is that they have all been withdrawn from the market because of cardiac side effects. And for example, a Vioxx has killed about 27,000 people in the United States alone because it was uh, causing very, very serious arrhythmia that hasn't been picked up in preclinical studies, the drug, neither clinical studies, so the drug was on the market. So you may be wondering, how is that possible? And just in this slide, I'm gonna summarize current drug discovery pipeline. After chemists make libraries of potential new uh, molecules, potential new drugs, they're usually screened in cell lines. They kind of look like this. They are transformed, usually human lines, sometimes animal cell lines with overexpressed human ion channels. So they, they're just thrown in 2D culture, they don't have any tissue organization, and as I mentioned, sometimes they're even uh, from animals. The next step is animal testing. Animal testing happens in highly inbred rodents, and there is no way to capture human genetic diversity. And after that, the drug goes in humans. And very often, that's the very first time this molecule will be exposed to human tissues. And if you compare that to amazing genetic diversity of people all around the world, it's very clear why uh, we cannot pick up these very subtle effects that would uh, be detrimental to a certain group of people. So then you may be wondering, how can we solve this problem? And definitely with IPS technology, with induced polyploidy stem cells, uh, now we can harvest adult cells uh, from pretty much anybody with informed consent, without ethical limitations, and convert these cells into IPS cells from which we can differentiate different cell types. Obviously, there are still some ethical concerns about who would own these cells, how would we store them, how do we share the data, etc. Et there, uh, there should be a framework that would address that, but we don't have to harvest uh, cells from embryos anymore to be able to make basically any cell type in the human body. So what is organo chip engineering and where does it come then? If we think about cells, the cells make the tissue. If you just have cells, it is very difficult to uh, capture tissue and organ level responses. And so we could take cells from tissue engineering paradigm from the patient, put them in bioreactors, on biomaterial scaffolds, and then the idea was to put that back into the patient, and cultivation was happening in large-scale, centimeter-scale bioreactors. Organo chip engineering borrowed some technologies from microfluidics, from microfabrication, where now this bioreactor is very, very small. It's basically micrometer scale, uh, but the idea of putting the cells in together with biomaterials has already been pioneered in tissue engineering. And so, we now shrink the scale and make really, really small tissues that uh, we can use for drug discovery and testing uh, of molecules. And so 
Is there an organ in organ or a chip? There is no organ, right? These are just tissue level structures and I'm describing here this pioneering uh, lung on a chip work that was published in Science in 2010. And if you can take a look here at the top uh, left, the organ on a chip device is basically just a membrane and on top of the membrane there is endothelial cells, the other side has epithelial cells and we can stretch this device and uh, to mimic the breathing motion. So this device has been commercialized by a company called Emulate and uh, it is possible now to buy and work with these chips. Uh, Organo Chip has had a tremendous uh, entrepreneurial activity. In just about 10 years or so, there has been probably over 70 companies that, has been, that have been started in this area. Some of them are shown in this slide. Um, you can see that basically we classify them in three different ways. Uh, companies that are focusing on interface where they can measure permeability like lung on a chip or kidney on a chip. Companies that are focusing on kind of chunks of tissue such as cardiac or liver or neural. And these are most often sites of post-approval drug toxicity. And that's why there is a very, very active area of development there. And then body on a chip where companies are trying to connect different organs together to create the whole body. Uh, you can see that this um, market is fragmented. There are a lot of small players, but right now uh, there are some attempts to consolidate them. For example, Baiko, which is worth multi-billion dollars, has acquired a number of smaller companies. So in the near future, there will for sure uh, be only a few big uh, players left standing. Uh, the overarching hypothesis is that better function will follow better form, that we have to control the structure, and that's something that we've done in my work as well. And I'll just spend the next couple of slides just to tell you the story about development of heart on a chip that I worked on. So the heart is very unique because you definitely cannot get cardiomyocytes from adult humans and make more of them. That's just not possible. And what I usually say, who's willing to give a heart biopsy for science? Nobody, right? Nobody ever puts their hand up for this. Nobody would like to have their heart biopsied for science. But even if you were willing to volunteer, we wouldn't be able to make more cells. But with iPS cells, we can make basically unlimited number of cells. We can differentiate them into cardiomyocytes. The problem is these cells are immature and they don't make a tissue. And that's something we can do with organ or chip engineering. So what we've done is uh, we have applied electrical stimulation. We use these microbioreactors like what's shown in the top uh, left to create strings of cardiac muscle and then we pace them to beat faster and faster and as they're beating faster they're maturing. And uh, in the follow-up we eliminated the, the suture that was in the middle that was holding this uh, tissue and we created a system where now we can measure contractile force. And I would say the hallmark of organ chip device is ability to assemble the tissue and ability to measure functional readouts. And if we can mature the cells, that's also an added benefit. And so you can see now we get a string of cardiac muscle and that's something that physiologists are very familiar with. But to, uh, by using these two polymer wires, uh, as they're deflecting, uh, and if we look at it under fluorescent, we can see the tissue will move the wires and through calibration curves, force displacement calibration curves, we can get force of contraction. So we can tell is the tissue beating faster, slower, is there a arrhythmia or not. So this enables us then to test drugs. And if you look at the bottom right, you will see this trace that's very messy, it says E4031. This messy trace is basically uh, a result of a blockage of potassium channel. It's the reason, uh, it's what was happening with Vioxx. It would block this Herc channel and cause arrhythmia in humans. Some of them have died because of that. With organ chip technology, we can pick up those disturbances in rhythm in uh, the heart tissue itself on the chip. And so one big question for the whole field is how do you know you have a good tissue that really mimics human responses? And I would say that heart and liver are the most advanced because over 10 years there have been consortia between government and industry that have been working on this to figure out what are the guidelines for validation. And through CIPA consortium, which stands for Comprehensive In Vitro Prioritmia Assay, they defined uh, 40 drugs that one should use to validate responses of their heart on a chip. And you can see here that this technology 
uh, BioWire Heart on a Chip that I presented previously, it picks up the responses of these uh, drugs correctly. They are classified into low, intermediate, and high risk for ar arrhythmia. This technology that we developed was commercialized through a company uh, called Tata Biosystems that I co-founded with uh, Gordana Vunjak Novaković and on purpose is actually a connection to Serbia. We wanted to pick a name from Serbia, but also a name that anybody can pronounce because uh, Serbian names nobody can pronounce, but this one, yes. And uh, well, how do you capitalize on an organ or chip? How do they add value? Clearly science is exciting, but ultimately everybody wants to have uh, some commercial benefit. So uh, after founding Tata in 2014, uh, the company got acquired in 2022 by an AI company. And this is not something we anticipated. We thought that pharma will acquire organ or chip company, but that's not really happening because the pharma looks at it as an assay. So nobody's gonna acquire like Western blot, right? They are, this is an assay. But AI companies, they have molecules, but they don't have human tissues. And Tata has developed models of human cardiac heart genetic disease. And uh, these models were very appealing. Now the AI generated molecules can be tested in human tissues. And just uh, last uh, September, this year, 2023, the combination of this AI and biology coming from uh, organ or a chip uh, was uh, compelling enough for Novo Nordisk to sign a deal going up to 2.5 billion uh, with VALO for development of cardiometabolomic um, uh, drug discovery. And so the challenges for our field are still numerous. We saw that uh, organs in a chip can add value by providing diseased and healthy human tissues with functional readouts. This is really important. That's how we differ from 2D culture because now we can tell is something beating stronger, faster? Is there more uh, permeability across barriers? There are many challenges, such as adoption in uh, broad adoption in industry validation. How do you know that this is really working? Automation in both production and running these assays, as well as further increasing cell fidelity by incorporating, for example, organoids. So we'll save our questions all from the end, and then I'll ask uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Katja schenke leyland to tell us a few things about um, detection. How do you uh, detect readouts in, in these systems and gen in general? Thank you very much. And I'm just thanking everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Radisic, and also the organizers for inviting me to this panel and also to talk about what uh, our research can contribute to this field of organ on chip and uh, advanced in vitro models as an alternative for animal models. And so I'm talking about enabling technologies um, for these advanced in vitro test systems. Now I found the right button. Technology is not easy. <laughs> As we just heard from Professor Radisic, um, yeah, there's a, a, a big advancement leap in the last actually 40 years. This is how long tissue engineering already exists. Um, but the last 10 years have brought a lot of technologies towards um, clinics, towards application in pharma and biotech. And so here are a couple of these advanced um, systems listed. We just heard about the advanced in, redo, in vitro models. Um, we also have been able to develop new materials for, for the healthcare sciences uh, in the field uh, of tissue engineering regenerative medicine. Then we also um, yeah, have advanced technologies, so technology development in terms of quality control, also cell material interaction, but also in vivo follow-up once then your material, your cells, or cell and material, so an advanced therapeutic medicinal product, has made uh, its way into patients, you still want to know what's going on. Um, and as we heard from Professor Radisic, um, it's important to look at functionality, but I'm a classical biologist, so we also want to know what's going on with the cells itself, so cell identity and also extracellular matrix proteins, so the entire microenvironment. And in order to look into these um, yeah, 
in, into these developmental steps and also cell identity, matrix identity, we need to use advanced um, yeah, diagnostic possibilities. So what's currently used are conventional readouts. Here are just a few examples listed. Um, immunofluorescence, so protein analysis, uh, yeah, FAX is one technology, for example, to look into cell phenotypes, so cell identities, uh, and then also you can measure secreted molecules um, and also use plate-based assays and arrays that are out there, and of course, gene expression analysis, single cell um, uh, sequencing, gene expression sequencing, what they all have in common is that you have to sacrifice your sample, you get a moment in time look into the cells, into the tissue, um, and also you have batch-to-batch -batch analysis. And so when you would then develop um, an in vitro test system or also an implant, you need to always have kind of a, a sentinel going with it, what you then can analyze with these um, invasive methods. And so what my lab has actually worked on in the last 20 years is to develop technologies that are marker independent, they're also non-invasive, and can be used on living cells and tissues. And uh, why is this attractive? Because you don't need any exogenous dye, so you don't have to introduce a genetically manipulated dye in order to make cells, for example, fluorescent, in order to see them in your cultures. Um, you also don't need to uh, have any time calculated for the processing, because you can look uh, at, in real time at the moment uh, of your uh, culture, also uh, just before an implant goes into a patient. Um, you don't need to do any processing, for example, with paraffin or cryosection, what are classically used in research and also development. Um, and yeah, the in situ measurements on cell differentiation, particularly when you use pluripotent stem cell sources, as we heard before, the iPS cells, you want to know if the cell is fully differentiated, specifically if it's not used as a test system, but it goes into as a, an implant into a patient. And of course, last but not least, you can also use these technologies for biomarker discovery and uh, development. So in my uh, group, in my lab, we have uh, focused uh, very early at the beginning on uh, multi-photon laser-based um, entities, but in yeah, the last 10 years we have also um, pioneered the work on Raman uh, spectroscopy and then also merging it with microscopic optical techniques, so Raman microspectroscopy and imaging, and also fluorescence lifetime imaging, so which is on, on this side, so this is multi-photon uh, laser-based. This is a lot, this is a busy slide for you, I think important uh, is to know that Raman signatures can give you a kind of a passport. So you have a passport for the cell. What is the cell's identity? What is the tissue identity? And you can do this on 2D and 3D. And then fluorescence lifetime imaging gives you information about um, function. So this is the metabolism of the cell and the tissue. What is the cell doing in disease? What is the cell doing in physiological development? And so since we only had a little bit of time, I had to be selective, and I want to give you a couple of examples how you can use this technology in the context of cell and uh, tissue analysis. And so I go into the examples of cellular phenotyping first, and then I would like to get the curve back into the organ on chip and in vitro uh, technologies. So for cellular phenotyping, as I mentioned, we have um, worked the last 10 years on gathering the expertise, the challenge with the technology. So Raman spectroscopy, uh, uh, for example, and, and specifically is around since yeah, more than half a century, actually. And it's used in pharmaceutical sciences, it's used in geology. Uh, right now, the Mars robot has a Raman sonde in it and sends information to Earth about molecules present at Mars. So this is not a new technology, but what's new um, also in, uh, in its use for life sciences is that you can use it for cells and tissues. And um, what we did is over the last 10 years, we acquired a database, and I think this is the most important thing, what we heard before, artificial intelligence, machine learning is only as good as the data you put in. And so you need to have extremely well-validated uh, and characterize data, and this is 
pretty much that, that slide what it's just meaning, um, that we work together with a lot of labs worldwide um, to acquire more data on all different cell types, different cell states and tissue, cell sta uh, tissue states. So here's first example I would like to show you. We use Raman for in vitro but also in vivo um, monitoring of the immune system. And here particularly we are interested in the many, many different phenotypes of macrophages. So uh, there's a rising um, number of macrophages. Most of us are looking into three types, the M0, the, so this is the, the baseline, and then if this macrophage decides the immune cell, uh, once you have an implant or also an, an injury in the body, this macrophage type is very flexible and can decide to be constructive or destructive. This is like in real world. So you have the M1, M2 macrophages, then they are either cytotoxic and destroy an implant, they can grow to um, yeah, in, in a capsule and then make your implant not functional anymore because of fibrosis, for example, or you have the macrophages that help the tissue to remodel, to integrate and function correctly. And what we would like to know is can we monitor this, can we also make fate decisions, show fate decisions in these M0 macrophages or in any uh, monocytical uh, cell type before they actually make the decision to go into that uh, line. And so this was the proof of principle study where we looked into gathering again validated data for our database to identify M0, M1, M2. And now we know for the future and we apply this to different projects now to see what are these cells in real time in cultures but also in explants of tissues that have been implanted into animal models or patients even. But we also develop zones so you can go into the body and these are uh, current uh, yeah, projects they're going on uh, in order to move forward, forward with this technology. What we can also do, and this is uh, what Milika um, presented uh, before, uh, it's important to get an understanding of these pluripotent cells when they turn into cardiomyocytes, for example. It would be extremely nice to have, again, here um, yeah, an information about uh, cell fate decisions early on. So when you have a pluripotent cell, it goes down towards the cardiac phenotype. It would be uh, nice to have a progenitor where we don't have really good surface markers right now. And if we have them, we need to use antibody stain or genetic uh, changes uh, introduced into these cells. But it would be nice to know that cell will become a pacemaker, that cell will become an arterial myocyte, that cell will become a ventricle myocyte, and so on. And so we did here studies where we looked into, again, gathering data for the database, and we are now able to um, yeah, sort these cells out and also predict cell fate decisions. Here is part of this work where we looked into mouse data and combined it with human data uh, and also what we heard, uh, and this is a really pioneering work from Professor Radisic's group, where we, we know of that these cells, when you differentiate them from pluripotent sources, that they are not necessarily matured. And so here um, with Raman, you can also have maturation features that help then again in vitro, also in vivo, to decide is a cell on a single cell level but up to um, a 3D a tissue culture or even an organ. Are all these cells matured? Are there immature cells there? May they cause arrhythmias? Again, if you want to go into a patient with cell therapies, you need to know that upfront before you can do that. Here we worked uh, on smooth muscle cells. Um, so, so we have a, a couple of organs uh, in the body that have smooth muscle cells and they are a few markers, biomarkers out there, they show us the identity of the smooth muscle cells, but they are all the same for all the different organs. But we do know there are different functions associated. A muscle cell in an aorta has a different purpose, a different function than a muscle cell in the uterus, for example, and in a bladder. And so we suspected there are molecular changes, but we don't have the markers out there from the classical protein or gene expression analysis. And so with Raman, we actually identified that there are differences between these organs. There are big differences actually between uh, these smooth muscle cells. And now again, we have the database fed so we can move on 
uh, to derive these cells from pluripotent sources and then identify smooth muscle cells. They will be contractile but not synthetic. They don't produce matrix for vascular applications. And then for uterine applications, you need a different phenotype. And here we can guide it. At least we know where we want to go. It's not uh, said that we know the, the way how to get there yet. So now for uh, the last part of the presentation, I would like to look with you into the 3D uh, in vitro cultures. And here we work really close together with Professor Loskell, who will present actually after me about the um, technologies he's developing in organ on chip. And uh, so I really don't go into that slide because he does a much better job than I do. <laughs> um, so I, I, I skip that um, and showing you the application, one of the applications we work with him about. So we are producing these insulin producing so pseudo islets um, uh, and uh, Peter Loskill provided us kindly uh, the chip technology initially because we wanted to keep these balls on our microscope stage without moving. <laughs> so this was the first intention. Now we know from his work that uh, this is also functionally much better than a static culture. Um, and so what we did then is we developed uh, a Raman setup. Here you see these are uh, Raman uh, images where we can identify um, the cells before you stimulate them with glucose, uh, and then you can also uh, follow uh, with Raman uh, live real-time analysis what happens with these cells. We uh, could identify a signature for these insulin-producing cells, and <clears throat> these signatures um, yeah, were assignable to the biology. So we have now a way to trace when a cell is ready to produce insulin. We can identify producer cells versus non-producer cells. And we also can rate the quality of the cell and predict their future behavior, um, which uh, helps for uh, several projects. What we also did here, because I talked before about the other technology, FLIM, fluorescence lifetime, and with these insulin producing pseudo islets. This is a, a beautiful application. We can also look into glycolysis and also uh, yeah, um, um, yeah, metabolomic changes. And we can detect here the metabolomic activity based on NADH and NADPH. We use an agent. I don't want to go into detail um, because I don't have time, but we have an exosolar matrix protein where we show that we can increase the production of insulin in these cells. And also we see that this is due to the fact that this protein protects the cells from hypoxia, so from dying, and we see that in the metabolomic um, changes, in the metabolomic patterns using FLIM. And uh, this is all done real time without the need to actually uh, using any gene or protein uh, labeling. Then here you see the, the readouts. Uh, again, uh, in, in, I cannot go into detail right now, but maybe we can talk later what exactly we are measuring in these cultures. And so the last example I want to show you is also that with Raman imaging, and these are all images, they are not antibody images. There are uh, these Raman uh, images based on wave numbers assigned to false coloring. Uh, we can also do drug efficacy testing in vitro and live cultures. And here we can not only see the impact on the cells itself, but we can also do drug tracing because Raman, I mentioned before, comes from pharmaceutical sciences. We can here identify the drug based on compounds on the biochemistry and can see what it does to the cell membrane, to the cell nucleus, to the cell cytosol. And so this is a very attractive um, yeah, technology for cancer research, for example. Here we teamed up with a group at the Robert Bosch Institute uh, in Stuttgart where they are looking into the treatment of uh, colon cancer uh, yeah, organoids. And uh, this is what we have. So here we have the treatment of the uh, um, patient-derived organoids and we can then monitor uh, the drug uh, and how the drug affects the cells. So to conclude, um, I hope I could give you a little bit tough to, to present that in a more layman uh, way, all this data on the Raman and, and uh, FLIM um, data, but I think I uh, could convince you there are possibilities um, enabling technologies to develop these technology, biotechnology development, as we heard it this morning, in order to then um, also further drive the uh, other technologies, such as organ on ship, towards the market, towards pharmaceutical uh, testing, and towards patients' health. Thank you.
I'll uh, announce the presentation by Professor Karp from Harvard. He's a serial entrepreneur, and he'll tell us in his presentation about the technology that he developed uh, to improve tissue adhesives. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, share my work today. My institution requires that I disclose my conflicts of interest, of which I have many. I've co-founded several companies. Uh, I hold equity in those companies and am an active consultant. I'd like to start off just by thanking the current and previous members of my laboratory um, who've just been really outstanding um, to work with. Um, I really think you know science is all about the people um, and I just really look forward to those in-person meetings or there's great exchange of, of fresh energy uh, every day. And you know I wanted to, to share with you that you know as I was coming out of my, my postdoc at MIT and starting my faculty position around 2007, I really wanted to, focus my laboratory on not just making scientific discoveries, but, but actually bringing that um, to, to patients as quickly as possible. And it really struck me that um, my training just, just really hadn't um, prepared me for that. And I really needed to seek out processes um, to, to, to help with that, um, with that goal. And so what I did was, um, you know, I really thought about it and, and um, and, and, and I started to experiment. Um, and what I found was actually meeting with people in the entrepreneurial ecosystem and forming relationships um, was exactly what I needed. Um, and so what I did is literally every two or three weeks for many, many years, um, I would, would, would meet with people such as um, patent lawyers and investors, reimbursement experts, CEOs, manufacturing experts, regulatory experts, biotech, medtech, consumer health um, experts. And it wouldn't just be like kind of single meetings, although sometimes it was, um, but it was looking for synergies, looking for potential ways to, um, to, to work together. Um, and what this process did is actually formed an, an informal advisory board for my lab. So as we were developing technologies, I had all these people in the entrepreneurial ecosystem and I would constantly reach out to them really at the very beginning of projects and, and throughout the projects. And that was critical, I think, to help steer um, the projects in the lab towards a potential translational um, you know, output, which is, you know, trying to move these technologies um, into the hands of doctors and, and into clinical trials. And one of the other things that, that I realized um, as well along the way is that a lot of what we do is, you know, sometimes we'll define the problem or often, you know, based on the biology, the biology problem or the science problem or the medical problem. But I realized that really to, to translate technologies and, and bring about um, you know, value to society and, and really help doctors and, and patients, we needed to think about the problem more broadly, almost like a Venn diagram and, 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 and look at the overlap. And so, yes, there's the biology or the science problem, the clinical problem, but there's also the manufacturing problem. Um, you know, if we can't manufacture the technologies that we're developing, it's going to be really hard to help patients in a short period of time. Same with, um, you know, we need to be able to get patent protection um, to have a strong intellectual property uh, portfolio. Um, and then also, you know, just another example is um, with regulatory, we want to know early on, you know, if this, what we're developing is going to work because we want to know what the comparator is going to be in a clinical trial because we want to try to include that as early as possible in our experiments um, to really help define, you know, importance. Um, uh, of our results, not just scientific importance, but actually importance to um, society. And so I, we spend a lot of time in my laboratory focusing on, on problem definition and, and trying to um, really think critically about it because um, it can be very helpful to direct us towards technologies um, that have a better chance of being translated. Um, and just to share with you a, a quick example, um, in August of uh, 2009, Dr. Pedro Del Nido, who's chief of cardiac surgery at Boston Children's Hospital, reached out, and um, you know he was uh, dealing with this this um, major problem, which is septal defects. So he was treating babies that have holes in between the chambers of their heart, and he said, you know, he tries to suture it, but it's just so fragile it tears. 
Um, and, uh, and, and there's devices that work in adults, but you can't downsize them because they're permanent materials. And as the heart is growing, it just outgrows the, the device. And so we envisioned a, a patch that you would put inside the beating heart. It would attach to the surrounding tissue um, and block the hole. And then cells could migrate on top of it, form new tissue. The material would degrade and the patient's left with their own tissue sealing the hole, which could then naturally grow with the, the patient as that material um, degraded. And so we ran into all kinds of challenges along the way, and I don't have time to go through, through all of them, um, but we were inspired by nature, um, creatures that exist within wet dynamic environments, um, such as slugs and snails and sandcastle worms. And so by kind of studying how they work, we, we gained inspiration and ideas that we wouldn't have really otherwise come up with that helped us to develop a, a tissue adhesive that could work in this incredibly harsh environment inside the human body. And um, well, I just want to give you one example of, of how this works. So we were able to show that this, this glue, we can attach a patch inside um, the beating part of a pig. Um, and so uh, we use this device that Dr. Del Nino developed. And we place this in, uh, you know, push this up against the septum in this pig model. And here it's going to kind of happen fast, but you can see a patch here on the left and one on the, the right. Um, I'll play it one more time because it's a bit quick, but um, the patches, we were able to get them to attach, you know, a lot of challenges and, uh, along the way, but um, we were able to figure out how to do it using inspiration from nature. And then we increased the heart rate with epinephrine and the patch patches remained attached. So we were really encouraged by, um, by this. This project was um, co-led by uh, Nora, who was in Dr. Del Nido's lab. She's a, a cardiac sur surgeon from uh, Germany. And uh, Maria, uh, here on the right, uh, who's a material scientist, um, who uh, um, was from Portugal, and she was in my laboratory. Uh, and we showed that the, the patch could remain attached for, for, for um, many beats of the heart. Um, so this was extremely encouraging. We also showed the glue could, could seal holes in the carotid artery of a pig and the uh, aorta of a pig. Um, so we started a company based on this technology, initially just, just focused on the glue. We also had a, a patch as well, um, but we, we focused on the glue and we were able to bring it to regulatory approval in Europe um, for vascular reconstruction um, and then also create all kinds of... Um, devices um, that could apply this throughout the body. So on the left here, you can see we could spray this um, glue on tissues. We added a blue dye uh, so surgeons could easily see it. In the middle, this is in a water tank, so we can apply the glue with a vacuum assist device. And on the right, um, through a trocar for minimally invasive um, application. And the company now is, has, has three verticals. Um, one is uh, cardiovascular sealing. Um, another is sutureless nerve reconstruction. Um, so uh, using nerves can be very problematic to, to suture through nerves to get them to anchor into these tubes that can guide the nerves to eventually connect. Um, so if we can do away with the nerves, um, we think we can get much better results. So this is an ongoing trial in Australia. Um, and then also um, tacks are used, these really hard kind of sharp tacks for um, hernia repair. They cause a lot of pain and, and they can also migrate and cause other problems. And so we found a way to use our glue um, to actually attach these um, meshes um, uh, without the use of tacks. And this also is uh, currently undergoing, uh, it's in a clinical trial in, in um, Australia. And so, you know, as I started, I, I, I referred to how really we lack this training in academia um, for translation. I would say based on my own experience, that um, while we may not be trained in it, we can learn it um, and we, we can evolve to do it. And, and for me, this really involved uh, kind of reaching out beyond the borders of my laboratory and, and institution and really connecting with people in the translational um, ecosystem and, and forming genuine relationships. So at this time, I, I just want to thank you so much for your attention. Um, and if anyone has any questions, um, I'm sure someone can get me those questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. That's really impressive, but it also took a long time, right? Almost 15 years to go through that approval journey. So we'll have Professor Peter Loskill. He can make eyes in a chip. And these eyes in a chip are used by many, many pharma companies already for uh, drug testing. Thank you, Milika. Um, 
So I'm going to be coming back to the world of, of organoid and chip and organoids after these impressive presentations. And I want to start with um, a little bit what is why, why, why we are doing this. Um, so why are we working on, on organoids and organoid and chip research? Um, and for us, the, the future of pharmaceutical R&D um, is a human-centric future. Um, it's not a future on curing animals, it's a future of, of curing humans. And um, we, we think we have the tools um, available, and um, if not in the next uh, near future, to actually realize that. And the vision we have is to have a, a future of a pharma R&D pipeline, which is entirely based on, on human um, models, um, starting with high throughput stem cell assays, going through organoids and organoid chip, to multi-organ chips, to a very high complexity system. While you lose throughput, you gain complexity. We will not be able to recapitalize an entire human being uh, w with these type of models. So what we need to do is we need to combine these in vitro and in silico models. And I think um, Amelia's example of Terra um, and now being an AI company is, is beautiful, how this is actually already evolving. Um, we might not be able to replace all of the animal testing. So we, there will be some, some pivotal animal um, models necessary, but by combining all of that with biobanks and databases, you can really go from a population-based um, pharma R&D to a, not only a human-centric, but an individual-centric um, development of um, drugs. And this is our vision. This is what we are working towards. And to do that, um, we are combining biology and engineering. So we're really trying to work at this interface of um, um, bioengineering and then translating these models that we're developing into applications that is mostly the pharma industry but also clinical research and um, mechanistic biomedical studies. So I won't have to give any introduction into the technologies due to uh, uh, the beautiful presentation from Milica. Um, so I'm going to jump right into what we're doing. So we have been over the last decade developing a, a wide range of different um, organ and chip models, including I, but also going all the way through um, metabolic and oncology um, areas. And to do that, um, you have it's, it's a very, very interdisciplinary effort. Um, and so I want to depict this in a, in a journey an organ and chip model takes during the development. You had really you start with an idea um, that is typically based on a defined scientific question, and then this idea um, is uh, when it leverages the, the human body for two things: as a structural blueprint, but also as a cell source. So we need human cells. We put that in a microfluidic device, and that's then the organ on a chip. And to implement that, you have to go through concept, uh, through different designs, materials, the engineering paths, the sensors, actuators, the cell sources and the biomaterials on the biological side, and then combine all of that to generate tissues in a microfluidic system and to build readouts, to gain confidence, to benchmark, and then you actually can go into applications. And one of the key steps, and that's, um, I brought here you a couple of examples how that can be done, is to actually generate a complex 3D tissue in a microfluidic environment, um, which recreates not only the structure, but also the function of, a, of an organ. And I want to show you that um, in, in, in three examples. And I'll, I'll start with our adipose chip. Um, and um, probably it would be very, look very different um, than when Milker asks who would, do, or who would give heart. Um, I would probably get a much better response if I would ask who would want to give adipose or fat. Um, and so <laughs> that's what we're actually leveraging. So adipose tissue is a highly complex tissue, which is not only... Um, um, uh, highly interesting tissue, but it's also highly relevant for a lot of diseases. Metabolic disease, obesity, diabetes, um, even for COVID, we saw that um, the, the adipose tissue plays a major role. So what we do, we get um, biopsies, because people want to give them, um, and we can isolate all of the different cell types that are in this adipose tissue. Um, and we get biopsies um, from subcutaneous cells, but we also get blood. And then what we can do in a, we call it a bottom-up um, assembly or a bottom-up tissue generation, we can take these individual cells and bring them in a platform. So this is an, an organ on a chip, this is the adipose chip, um, and it's meant for um, a an, an, an gentle injection of um, tissue or cells and mixtures in 3D chambers. And so what we do, we inject, for example, the adipocytes, the thromovascular fractions, all of these immune cells, in a, a, a cylindrical tissue chamber, then we can add um, endothelial cells on top in a, in a perfused channel so that we really have an endothelial barrier 
And then last but not least, we can also circulate immune cells through the system to look at the recruitment and the interaction with the immune system. So this is an example of how we can actually generate a tissue with a high comp complexity in terms of cellular diversity in um, a patient-specific manner. Another example I want to show you is uh, our heart on a chip system. And um, I'm going to uh, explain to you very well why we need uh, heart on a chip models. So we focused here on a, a little bit of a different approach on a building block assembly approach. So we want to have a user-friendly way of generating uh, heart muscle fibers in a microfluidic chamber. So what we do, we use um, spheroids, which are complex 3D tissues, but they don't have the right architecture. So we take these spheroids and then we use a, um, an, a hydrostatic pressure-driven flow where you don't have to do any manual work and they, these spheroids then pop in our dog bone-like um, chambers. And then after 20, within 24 hours, these spheroids start to merge and you actually end up with, with, a, uh, with a muscle fiber-like structure. So if you then look into 3D there, you can see that they're highly aligned. Cardiomyocytes really uh, recreating the, the structure in a very high density. That's what you, what you have in a... In a and heart muscle, and not only on the level of an individual spheroid, but really on the level of the entire fiber, and they are also electrically connected. So if you do calcium imaging or use the reporter cell line, you can actually see that there's a, um, they're highly connected. So this is another approach on how you generate complex 3D tissue, and in this case, with a very high cell density. And then you can even go more complex, and this is the retina. Um, the retina is, in my view, maybe the most complex tissue in the human body. Um, you have a lot of different cell types and a lot of different layers. They interact very specific ways with each other. Um, and only through this interaction you can actually um, have function. So if you take photoreceptors, they're interesting, but they, that, that's not a retina. Um, and the problem is if you want to recreate this with engineering, even if you're the best engineer, maybe you could, but we couldn't. Um, so we decided we, we combine, on the one hand, our engineering and the developmental biology. So we combine organoid and organoid and chip. And this is how this um, system looks like. So we now integrate a building block in organoid, which is based on the stem cell differentiation and the following organogenesis. You have already a lot of these structures. And we integrate it there. We add this on top of an epithelial layer. And this is how it looks. So you put an epithelial layer. It's a very specific epithelial. Um, it has a very um, physiological structure, and then you add an organoid on top, and you place this organoid, and now you have all of the different layers of this retina. And these layers, or the photoreceptors, then start to grow out. Segments actually interact with this um, um, uh, uh, epithelial layer, and thereby you have a highly dynamic and physiological system. And I want to show you also here um, how you can apply that. So we use this retina chip now in a, in a huge number of, of um, contract research um, projects um, for efficacy and safety assessment. Um, we used it for a lot of, um, let's say, small molecule ocular toxicity monitoring. Um, one of the examples we used was chloroquine. When we did that, no one knew it. Now everyone knows chloroquine. And um, if you um, listen to some people, you might have turned blind because it has a very, very strong um, uh, ocular side effect. But what we also could see, uh, do, we could also test new types of modalities. So we're using this model to test gene therapies. We're adding gene therapies in an intravitreal or a subretinal like treatment. We separate this blood perfusion in the choroid from our drug delivery. And then you can look over multiple weeks. You can monitor the transduction efficacy, the tropism of different types of gene therapies. And this is, um, for example, a work together with Gloria Ingelheim, and they're using this now to um, move or to decide on which of, the, of their capsids um, and plasmids to move forward. That's one of the um, possibilities on how you use this system. Another possibility is um, to actually use it for cell therapy testing. I'm not jumping in a totally different field, the oncology. So we have a tumor on a chip model where we have two more organoids, patients who have two more organoids, um, and we have a, a perfused media channels with endothelial cells, and now we can perfuse CAR T cells, and we can look at why do CAR T cells don't, so why do they have such a low efficacy against solid tumors? And we, so what we do, we look at CAR T cells, we look at non-transduced T cells, and we test um, how much are they actually infiltrated in the tissue, how is their efficacy, and how can we play around with the, the CAR T cells, but also the tissue composition, to make them more efficacious. And also, for example, um, test um, combination therapies. So test different types of combinations of small molecules and um, um, cell therapy in actually bringing or improving the efficacy, or in this case, actually reducing side effects such as cytokine release syndrome. 
So these are two examples on how these models can actually be used in a pharmaceutical setting. And with that, I'm already at the end. I need to thank this team. This is um, my amazing team that does all of that work um, and um, allows me to travel the world and present our nice, um, um, nice data um, while they do all of the, the hard work in the lab. So thank you very much. At the very end, we'll have uh, Professor Sabeth Verporte summarize and close and give us her, uh, her thoughts about the future of this field and the biggest challenges. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Malika, Professor Radizic, um, and the organization for the opportunity to be here today. It's um, enormously exciting to be at this type of meeting, which talks more about strategy about biotechnology ecosystems and all the rest of it. And it's extraordinarily interesting to take my own work and see where it fits into all of that. So it's a, a very unique opportunity for me. Um, I'm from the University of Groningen in the in north of the Netherlands. Uh, I'm an analytical chemist, and I've been focusing on the use of microfluidics or lab on a chip work for um, bioanalytical chemistry um, over the duration of my career. Um, and so what I'd like to do here is to talk a little bit about how we apply microfluidics to the sorts of experiments that my colleagues have been uh, describing to you. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. I'm going to take you a little bit more into the organ on a chip um, and uh, to, to take a look at the importance of the microenvironments that we can create for um, uh, biological systems. And Okay. Um, interesting. I lost a figure. The figure is one that you've already seen, actually. It was of a mouse sitting on an in vitro well plate. Um, and um, what I wanted to, to t uh, say there is uh, clearly there are a number of different biological models that have been developed over the centuries, really, as we scientists seek to understand the physiological processes that underpin life. Um, the essential or the uh, existential um, model, of course, is human beings. Uh, I couldn't find a picture of a human being on an in vitro plate, so it was the mouse instead. Um, but uh, indeed, there you uh, can look at systemic responses and so on. Very interesting, but of course, we want to look at, we want to tease out individual inform or information about individual processes, which make up. Um, our um, physiological systems. And so we um, go to um, far simpler systems to do that. The well plate is pretty much the simplest system, of course. Um, and so there's a huge difference between those two extremes, those models. Um, I will remind you that all the cells in the mouse and in the human being, um, that they are only 100 micrometers or so removed from a blood vessel, a vessel which brings them nutrition, removes waste products, and so on. Cells in a well plate are exposed to medium with nutrients and so on. However, there is no means for us to regulate um, delivery of nutrients um, and removal of waste, for instance, to those cells, uh, or to regulate other sorts of transport processes. And so I think the challenge for us these days and, and uh, is to incorporate some form of regulation uh, into our systems. And the organ on a chip, of course, is a way to do that. Um, very important for organ on a chip is the development of microfluidics. Uh, about 30 years ago, um, you see here on the left-hand side, um, oh, um, <laughs> the, um, you see here on the left-hand side, a chip. This is why we call it a chip. It's planar. You can hold it in your hands and you can see into it. In fact, that ability to see into these systems, I think, is um, something that we just take for granted these days, but which um, really um, allows us to gain um, far more information um, these days about what's going on inside those microchannels. The microchannels you see on the right-hand side this is a very simple system, two channels intersecting with one another, but you see here already um, how um, well we can manipulate two solutions in order to produce very tiny volumes um, for further analysis. Um, and of course, if you make it onto CNN, 
you know you've made it. Um, and uh, so this technology started off the late 1980 or the late uh, 1980s indeed, um, and really took off um, in the 90s. Um, here's a, an example of another example of manipulation of very small plugs of solution. We see again two channels intersecting each other, one filled with a fluorescent, a fluorescent solution in the vertical direction, one filled with colorless buffer in the horizontal direction. You don't see that channel per se. Um, but what's demonstrated here is, for me as an analytical chemist, um, fascinating. We can form a plug of solution at the intersection of those two channels by manipulating the way that the uh, solutions are moved around in the branches um, linking up to the intersection. And we see how that very small plug of solution can be injected onto a horizontal channel um, and under the influence of high electric field, the two um, fluorescently labeled species, um, charred species, can be separated from one another. Now, you see just how fast this can happen. It happens um, in 160 milliseconds over a distance of 300 micrometers. 300 micrometers for you all is uh, three human hairs laid side by side, okay? Um, this is the fascination this shows uh, of this technology. It shows uh, how precisely we can control solutions, how precisely we can contain molecules um, and um, manipulate them in these systems. These channels are on the order of tens of micrometers wide, tens of micrometers deep, and so in fact we can also very um, easily confine cells um, in these systems and manipulate them. Um, so we've injected 20 picoliters in this case. That's 100,000 times smaller than the smallest volumes from a micropipette. And we, in fact, could even use a 12-volt battery to create the electric field we need for this particular separation. It's all about fluid and fluid control. And I, this is the reason for the success of this technology when it comes to um, the organ on a chip. Um, we can use microfluidics then to um, mimic um, nature. Um, we see here human umbilical vein endothelial cells, cells that grow on the inside of blood vessels in our bodies. Um, on the left-hand side, cultured in a, in a well plate. On the right-hand side, cultured uh, in a microchannel. And what you, um, you see, there's a clear difference in the way that these cells look in these two environments. Very simple experiment, but you already see the influence of microenvironment. That microchannel mimics the in vivo structure that these cells find themselves in. It allows flow or micro, for microfluidic perfusion culture, and it allows for very well-defined spatiotemporal gradients of nutrients and so on, using the ability to manipulate molecules and cells that we have with microfluidics. Um, so that's looking from the outside in. The wonderful thing about our chips is that we can look into them. This is an experiment where we did the opposite. Um, we um, cultivated cells in microchannels versus wells, um, and we um, ex uh, exposed them to, um, in both cases, to TNF-alpha, a molecule that makes them feel like they're in an inflammatory uh, situation, an unhealthy situation. And we exposed cell cultures to TNF-alpha, but also a drug in order to decrease the inflammation. Um, this is gene expression data um, for um, um, uh, interleukin-8, a cytokine which is produced um, uh, more readily um, in an inflammatory situation. Um, I, the fascination of this diagram for me is, the, is not the fact that both sets of cells ref respond in a similar way to TNF-alpha and TNF-alpha and the drug. My fascination is that the, is that the response is far, uh, far larger. It's amplified for the cells that have been cultivated in the microchannel. Um, and so there's clearly a difference here in microenvironment. And we may actually even be able to exploit that to produce more sensitive testing, let's say, for cellular response in microchannels. Um, okay, um, we're going to skip this as well. Um, I'll talk about a, a different sort of organ on a chip, which is based on uh, liver slices in this particular case. This is a, a model which has been developed, and I'm going to 
Um, it's, uh, the liver slice model is a model that's been um, developed um, in Groningen. See here millimeter-sized um, uh, diameter slices sitting in microfluidic chambers of 25 microliters. Um, the sorts of experiments we can do with this um, system um, are really quite fascinating. These slices, by the way, are being perfused um, from underneath um, around, uh, to uh, the top of the chamber, and so those liver slices are getting uh, the nutrients and so on that they need. My favorite experiment with this system is one which includes not just liver slices, but also intestinal slices. Um, and so that's, we've uh, shown schematically how we do that. We have an intestinal slice in the first chamber, which is linked, the outlet of which is linked to the inlet uh, of the chamber uh, containing a liver slice. Um, and the idea here was to take a look at first pass metabolism. Um, we looked, in fact, at organ interaction um, the, in the regulation of bile acid synthesis by the liver. Uh, just very briefly here, um, the liver produces bile acid um, in order um, to help um, the intestinal system to uh, digest fat. Um, and so the liver responds to bile acid in um, the circula circulatory system. Uh, if the amount of bile acid goes up, um, the CYP7A1 enzyme is downregulated and less bile acid is produced by the liver. The liver does not exist alone, clearly, in um, the body. Um, it is preceded by the intestinal system. And as it turns out, the intestinal system also can be regulated by the presence of bile acid, and we see that here. Bile acid uh, upregulates the production of fibroblast uh, growth factor 15, and that protein, in fact, also can regulate that CEP7A1 enzyme. And so we reproduced this uh, in vivo organ interaction regulation process uh, in our system by perfusing sequentially an intestinal slice um, and a liver slice. Does it work? Um, yes, it does. We broke, we um, did gene expression analysis to, uh, first of all, demonstrate that the intestinal slice works, um, and it does. The gene expression for the production of um, fibroblast growth 15, uh, fibroblast, fibroblast growth factor 15 um, production uh, goes up, um, and so, um, uh, the intestinal slice is working. Uh, this is the more interesting set of data, though. Um, you see that if you go from a control um, liver slice to a liver slice being perfused with medium containing bile acid, that, in fact, the CEP7A uh, um, enzyme is downregulated by 25%. If you include an intestinal slice before the liver slice, um, that downregulation is increased to 60%. So what we've managed to do, in fact, is to reproduce a physiological interaction um, directly in a microfluidic device, um, which I think has um, great um, implications for further development of the, the sorts of systems that you have already seen. All right, um, so we can do very nice experiments with microfluidics and biological material that we never could do before. I just uh, run through um, this list um, of um, aspects with respect to that. I think importantly, we're now beginning to know, learn how to do real-time observation and, and analysis of cell behavior thanks to the sorts of analytical techniques that my colleague um, has uh, shown you today as well. I thank you for your attention and I thank um, our uh, funding, uh, funding agencies as well. We'll, we'll take questions from the audience because we had a, we have a really excellent audience who's sticking around despite us giving them away from lunch. So let's see. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for this question. Yes, this is actually one of the main parts where we do research on lipids, phospholipids, and we can quantify and also identify the types. I hope to <laughs> find me if I don't find you. <laughs> More questions? 
If not, I'll just have a question for our panelists. Where do you see organs in a chip fit in uh, drug discovery? In what step? Are we going to use them before animals, after animals? Are they going to replace animals? Are we going to be done with animals? Yeah. I'm pressing all buttons. Yeah. Okay, now it's working. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think the answer is uh, simple and complicated. Um, I think everywhere. Um, so the, the, there are, let's say, applications um, both in the in the preclinical phase, in discovery, target discovery, and then later on also in, in, in both safety and efficacy testing, but also during the clinical phases um, to, to stratify um, patient populations, and potentially even after um, after approval. Um, I mean, we've seen it very nicely with the, the organoid work from Hans Klevers in the Netherlands on, on, on kind of a, a companion diagnostic approach. So I, I don't think there's one specific part where um, these type of organoid chip, organoid MPS will fit, but there's a lot of different niches, and yes, they will replace animal tests um, at some point in certain areas, um, but they will for, most importantly make the, 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 let's say, the entire process uh, more predictive. Thank you. Sabit has some thoughts also. Working at an institute of pharmacy, um, my colleagues will, um, will say that you'll never eliminate animal testing all, uh, completely. Um, but um, I, I agree with Peter. I think um, there's just a whole spectrum of different sorts of applications that you um, can take a look at. And some of those applications will be very well served with organ on a chip models that, um, represent, um, that are representative. I think the nice thing about organs on a chip is that it allows us to, to move away from animals in any case um, to a large extent. Uh, if we can uh, if we can go directly to using uh, human tissue and, 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 and certainly this sort of concurrent developments in stem cell biology have allowed us to start thinking about that um, um, yeah you can do far more intelligent experiments I suppose and yeah sure yeah. Uh, this one doesn't work okay is, is it oh now it's yeah, working no. perfect Okay, maybe I shouldn't touch it. <laughs> so in Baden-Württemberg, we have the Centers for Personalized Medicine, and there's actually um, uh, precision medicine. And precision medicine, we need to convince, of course, the healthcare um, organizations to pay for it. Um, and uh, here, the, uh, maybe the advanced test systems, it's not all just organ on chip. Sometimes <coughs> there's no microfluidic involved yet. But here there are no animal tests. Um, they don't make sense, they don't exist. And so we have uh, precision medicine for uh, single patients. Unfortunately, right now it's end stage um, patients. They are completely, everything in, in Western medicine has been used. They don't uh, react on that. And here the uh, patient arrived test systems, they uh, uh, make a difference in uh, discovery and also repurposing because you can identify therapies that potentially work after everything else has been tried on the patient material itself and you can do this in high throughput and so here this is just some something which yes. would be actually advantage and in the future I think it goes there that you can start much earlier on in first line yeah. diagnostics and so if we are there and um, the healthcare insurance is reimbursed that then this will make a huge difference in uh, yeah. patient care. See if there is more from the audience. If not, I'll ask the last question for the panel uh, for today. Are we ever going to be able to make the whole human body on a chip? And is that necessary? <laughs> um, I think the answer to that question is no. Um, uh, you know, uh, organ on a chip, we, we've made enormous advances in organ on a chip. I've, I saw some lovely um, cardiac examples this morning and so on. Um, but there, you know, the body is so compartmentalized. There are so many biological interfaces over which transport of signaling molecules and, 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 and sort of the regulatory parts of our bodies um, uh, happen. Um, I don't see us reproducing that to that level, exquisite level, orchestrated level of operation anytime soon. Um, and perhaps, 
yeah, perhaps we don't really want to do that, you know? Um, I think this idea, the, 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 one of the questions I enjoy with, about uh, organ on a chip is trying to understand the, um, uh, what level of uh, complexity you actually need to answer a particular question. And I think gener sometimes I think that we're still aiming for too much complexity in our systems for the questions that we want to answer. Is there anything else? Yeah, I, 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 I fully agree. I, I think to answer both of your questions, um, I would give a clear no. We, we, mm. we will never achieve it, but we also will never need it. Um, I think the, 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 what I try to depict, the, the combination, the solution lies in the combination of in silico and in vitro. Um, so we, we can use in vitro models to look at specific mechanistic questions um, to generate data that then can be fed in an in silico model, in a digital twin. Um, and then we can use it on the other hand um, to whatever comes out of this in silico model to try and benchmark and, and test the hypothesis that maybe a, an AI model gives you. So I don't think we will ever need it and I don't also think we would ever be able to do it because of the complexity. Um, so, I, for me, uh, the, the term body ownership or human ownership is a sales pitch, um, which, is, which is also fine, um, but the, the real power lies in, in, in real one or two organ systems. I agree, I agree with Peter um, that it, it's an academic exercise um, yeah. uh, and uh, the possibilities of in silico in a combination with real world data, uh, organ on chip, also uh, patient data, this would definitely make a difference. Yeah. So, and what's the success then for organ on a chip? How do we know we succeeded? You, me. <laughs> yeah. What's the success? The success is if we have better drugs quicker. Yeah. I think that's the better and safer. So better means more efficient and safe. Um, and um, yeah. will I be able to do that? Quickly? Yeah, yeah. I hope it's going to become just a commodity, like a well plate, mm -hmm. and something that people use all the time, and they don't need a special session about. But we can definitely see in a lot of fields, like for example, cardiac, for sure, more and more assays are being developed in these treated tissues. So uh, let's thank our speakers and panelists and. Uh, Thank you very much also for staying until the very end and we can now join the lunch and uh, thanks a lot uh, for coming to this session. Thank you. Dobar dan svim. Good day to you all. Uh, very nice. Uh, I'm really happy to host this panel today. Maybe there is some echo there. Okay, thank you. So my name is Jelena Bojic and I'm the head of the Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution. In <laughs> Maybe I should switch to Serbian and she translates in English. Okay. Let's, let's check again. It's already fun. At least you're, you're not gonna sleep. <laughs> okay, so uh, the way we are gonna start this panel today is I'm gonna have a sh very short presentation. If it goes too long, please wave. I'm just joking. <laughs> I'll try to be brief, and, but I want to set the stage for the panel that we will have. And I want to explain why we are having this panel today. So um, the presentation that I'm going to give is on the current projects of the Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution and where we are in Serbia today. And this is why we invited these people for the panel here so that we can discuss the topic that is in our focus today in Serbia. So just briefly, uh, so that you know, someone asked me why this center is uh, established in Serbia anyway? How come the World Economic Forum decided to establish the center in Serbia? But the idea is the, the innovations are moving really fast and we need good policies in different countries all over the world to, to shape the policies in a way that they help innovation, that they don't hinder innovation, because it happens all over the world. You know, we have researchers, we have innovations, but they're not implemented. We wait for 10, 20 years. COVID actually helped us with, with uh, we, we've been in rush. So the innovations, especially in mRNA and other new technology were fast to implement. 
throughout the world. So I think that the, the centers throughout the world are actually formed with the idea to stimulate fast implementation of innovation, but still to be secure. So the center was established last year, and I'll just show these are the initiatives that we already started. I didn't want to show this uh, photo, but uh, a colleague of mine told me, let's, let's uh, show the flower. So, <laughs> but uh, the reason why we want to show this is like, what are the initiatives that we are covering? What, what important, important for Serbia is that we focus on several things. One is the, the policy itself. Second is the infrastructure to support the innovations. What does that mean? We, we all talk about data. But we are going to restore the data, how we are going to work on processing the data. So this is the issue and this is what we are trying to support um, the, the innovators to, to work on. And third, maybe most important thing is how to help startups and innovators do they think, their thing, how they implement their pilot projects. They always need support from someone in the government to help them guide them through the processes. So this is what we do. And I'm going to talk about two major projects that we are going to discuss um, today as well. One of them is DNA screening project. And we talked um, a lot about prevention and pre precision medicine. And we talked about how we can learn before we get sick. So this is the DNA screening. The project is just started in Serbia with the idea that we uh, identify 1,000 individuals, we'll, we'll start with 1,000, hopefully we'll have a 1 million in a few years. Uh, I'll talk later on with Ning Lee to, to help us do that fastly. <laughs> they do 1 million probably in a day. But um, we will start with, uh, with 1,000 um, genomes, with 1,000 people, and what are we going to focus on? So we're going to um, target, our target group are the individuals between 20 and 40 years of age, I'm too old. So, but we are focusing on people that can um, actually, that have some, that we can uh, identify potential diseases and that they can react on time. So this is the idea, targeting 20 to 40 years of age, 1,000 sample, next generation sequencing, whole genome sequencing, this is what we are trying to do. And what I started to talk about at the beginning, like what we provide, we pro provide the infrastructure where we will have the, the data stored and processed as well. Uh, Two major aspects. What we learned in Serbia, at least, we had really separated activities in the science from the, from the health sector. So what we want to do is to create a project where we all rely on each other. So it's both scientific and, and health uh, project in the same time. So we will connect the data that will help our uh, researchers design their studies and publications but in the same, and learn from the data, but in the same time we will treat patients. And what we will do, we will build together with our um, um, health sector uh, the protocols on how to treat people that we identified has some um, genetic mutation or some um, disease. So um, I think some of the desired outcomes are um, early detection and prevention, um, uh, improving the diagnostics, development of treatment protocols. So these are the, the major, but I think uh, the most common ones. Why, and which uh, uh, diseases are we picking? Wh what are we thinking about is the ones that are the most common in Serbia or there are the most people um, um, dying from them. So it's um, hereditary cancers, uh, cardiovascular diseases, and uh, but besides the, 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 the disease themselves, we are also going to look at the carriers. Uh, like um, we know that we have throughout uh, in our faculties, we do have the SMA screening uh, protocols for the newborns. What we are trying to do is identify the carriers of some diseases before uh, we are even in, in a stage of pregnancy so that we do know what to pay attention on. So this is one uh, in addition to that. In addition, and I'm really happy that I have Branka Zukic here, we're going to focus on, um, on identifying uh, which, um, uh, on, to, wor to work uh, on um, genomics uh, in a sense of uh, pharmaceuticals, so, so pharma genomics, uh, and this is one uh, important aspect as well. Um, I, I wanted just to show that we are working with the consent, and this is the, the, the critical aspect, and we will talk about policies and how to create policies that people accept this kind of um, uh, work so that they understand better what does the genetic sequencing means. 
uh, and uh, uh, have their consent in, uh, in that sense. And I just showed some of the players so that you know that we are not alone because we are not working on sequencing through the center, but uh, by, by the help of different institutes that are here in Serbia. The second project that we are working on is something that fits well with the one plus million genome project of EU. And this is what we are doing in Serbia as well. We are working on the registry uh, of genomic data in Serbia. We just passed the law on uh, health, medical and genetic data uh, in Serbia. Uh, it was passed in the government, it's in the parliament next week. So hopefully it will be adopted by the end of next week. And this is uh, what we are going to create. We are creating the genetic and biomedical data registry. We learned from some of the people that are here, from uh, Mark Bale, uh, because we, we in, I think back in January, we went uh, to see how UK does uh, their 100,000 genome project and what were the issues that they faced and what are the issues of other um, genomic registries in the world. And it's usually lack of combination between genetic data and health data. So this was majority, in majority of cases, there, these registries, genomic data are lacking um, other part and this is uh, uh, health data. And this is what we are trying to avoid. Uh, the, the registries that we are creating will consist of both data. We are taking actually the data. Um, so I talked about I'm faster than the slides. So, so uh, what we are trying to do, and we are in the same time building something uh, that you already um, know about, it's electronic health record. So we are collecting the health data at one place and then combine this data with the registry of genetic data so that we can uh, have um, um, genotype together with the phenotype and understand um, and the, the, full, um, the full data. So genetic data and biomedical data at one place. And what we are really um, happy about is that this will be also the portal for the researchers and health um, uh, center workers to access this data. Of course, again, I have to mention with the consent of the users, with the consent of the individuals whose uh, data is uh, available. And of course, we are establishing something um, called uh, a board that makes the decision on the ethical uh, usage of this data. So this is the, the reason why we are today. I hope I didn't go too, too fast. Nobody was yawning. So that's good. So, uh, and it will be my pleasure now to invite uh, my panelists to discuss uh, the topics that I, that I just laid out. So uh, it is my pleasure first to invite Mr. Uh, Ning Li. Welcome, the Vice President of BGI Group coming from China. Thank you. Please, uh, second one, second one, sorry. I was supposed to sit there, but <laughs> That's the, the next person that I want to invite also, uh, the person that I mentioned, uh, Mark, Mark Bale, please welcome. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> He's one of the people that taught a lot of us on how to design this registry. Then Professor Yang Ye, welcome. From Shanghai Institute of Ontario Medica. Thank you so much for coming. And the last but not the least, Dr. Banka Zukic, please welcome from the Institute for Molecular Genetics and Genetical Engineers from Serbia. First of all, first of all, <laughs> yeah, I have to be a bit slower. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining me on this uh, on this panel, and hope um, hope I, I gave the the general overview of what we are doing in Serbia and why you you are here. So I would like uh, maybe first to start start with Mr. Uh, Ning. Uh, I mentioned that it is um, uh, one of our activities is creating of the registry of genetic data. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been talking about uh, how um, expensive or non-expensive. The, the, the process of uh, um, getting the data about uh, um, gene, genomic data throughout the world are and what the BGI is doing right now on that. Okay, so I'm truly happy to be here to share our uh, experience, uh, especially in China. So actually that is the very important thing to understand why we need to launch this project. Uh, maybe that is for the scientific purpose that is for sure. And another way right now we are doing in China that is from the public health 
aspect. So we just launched this prevention public health project. And uh, currently we already finished about 24 million, the screening test you mentioned in China. So actually that is a big data. So that is uh, at the first. Million. 24 million. 24 million screening okay. testing. Whole genome? Uh, actually, that is a genome wide information, but not uh, the uh, 30x, but that is a lower, low, low pass, but that is a genome wide. Okay. So actually, this is the, for the public health. For example, that is non invasive prenatal testing. That is the whole genome sequencing, but that's a low pass. Right now, we already finished the, totally the non-invasive prenatal testing uh, in China, about uh, uh, 13 million tests, 13 million tests, that is the whole genome. And uh, actually, the input and the output for this public health project in China, we, we already have the da data, that uh, the government invested one CNY and can save 10 CNY on the therapy. So the prevention project Actually, that is not only burning the money, that is to save the money. And during that part, we can also accumulate this, uh, the data for the basic research. So that is very good business, huh? <laughs> and actually, not only the non-invasive prenatal testing, I also want to share more uh, projects we already finished, such as uh, we finished about uh, 7 million HPV testing, and uh, also that is the input and output, uh, the ratio. That is the government invest to one CNY, and we can save about uh, 13 CNY uh, for the, uh, to, 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 to on the prevention for the cervical cancer. And uh, also we perform about 1.3 million gene screening testing for the thalassemia. And also we generate our own technology for the uh, gene therapy for thalassemia, including the beta and the alpha. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the, 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 the closest circle. So the input and output ratio, that is uh, invest one CN, uh, CNY and we can save about uh, uh, 15 CNY. So that is the real the data. Before I switch to, to uh, another <laughs> panelist, I just wanted to ask a question that I actually posed during mm -hmm. my presentation that combining genetic and health data? Uh, for sure, uh, I have to say, this public health project, that is the BGIV uh, support, the, the, the our partner on the uh, genomic technology. And the health part, the uh, clinical data, <laughs> definitely should be combined together. But yes. at this point, it's still not through the project that you have, or it is being are the physicians getting the data from the genomic uh, analysis that you do, uh, do as well? And is, is this part of the electronic health record of the people in, in China? Uh, so uh, let me explain okay. that, that, okay. that, that. So for this uh, public health project, the genomic data that is uh, already good enough to provide this uh, testing and uh, this mm -hmm. clinical report. But by using this uh, data, from this uh, public health project mm -hmm. for the further research that is to integrate more information. So I think that is two parts. Thank you. I, wanted, I want to switch now to, to Dr. Bale. Um, basically, what I said that uh, by designing the registered genomic data in, in Serbia, we've been looking at a um, uh, 100,000 genome uh, project of UK, and we wanted to, to learn um, from you uh, how it all started there, and then you can maybe tell us the story about um, Ireland as well and how, what's the difference between the two projects. So firstly, U UK um, Genome Project and... Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah, so, so, so that's uh, a, a long story, and I think what I would just start with is, of course, uh, reminding ourselves that the 100,000 Genomes Project started 10 years ago when Apart from BGI, there was very little kind of experience of whole genome sequencing. Uh, it was very expensive and it was felt to be um, unrealistic for a standard health service. So I think what the 100,000 Genomes Project did as much as anything was a kind of big bang. It was a big event to try and get uh, the, 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 the technology uh, cheaper, uh, to get people more comfortable with that. So I would emphasize, and maybe we could pick this up because I'd be fascinated in others' experiences, actually uh, training the workforce. But the ultimate sort of driver for this, and I think it's very interesting to uh, 
look at the, the leadership I see in Serbia was that our prime minister at the time, David Cameron, had his first child was born with a rare condition. And he uh, and his uh, wife uh, were very worried about the child, Ivan, who sadly died later. But they were also unsure about whether there were future pregnancies were, were at risk. So they were in this limbo, this kind of lack of reproductive confidence. And he, he basically said, I wasn't there, but he said to his advisors, I've been through genetic diagnosis and I didn't think it was great. I want to do something to improve it. What should I do that's big? And that's why we did 100,000 genomes. That's why we had a, a slightly different approach to the one you've described in that we particularly looked at rare diseases and, mm -hmm. and cancer. And in order to be eligible for the project, you effectively had to have uh, not had a diagnosis through standard of care. So it was kind of like a, an additional step. And maybe now, uh, where's Branislava? Maybe now I could just flash this up and mm -hmm. I don't want to dominate this conversation. But I think one of the things that um, I liked about the diagram you showed uh, is a lot of two-way arrows. That the data was flowing to researchers and back to the, data, the registry and back to healthcare. We've, in Genomics England and with the NHS, have described this as the infinity loop. And I think what this diagram, if you can see, tries to explain is that uh, a clinician is responsible for the care of the patient. They then take a sample and consent and so on. Genomics England sequences it. It provides a bioinformatics report, but it also makes the, available, the data available for researchers. And it's in a, in a semi-anonymized fashion so that you can then, maybe through research, connect back to the patient. So this kind of infinity loop is supposed to be uh, rapidly. And it's, it's interesting in the UK context and maybe in some countries that I've experienced because um, traditionally, research and clinical services are two separate things. Sometimes they're two separate ministries, two separate mm -hmm. funding streams, even two separate workforces. We've tried to bridge those with the uh, role of Genomics England, with this infinity loop. Um, and it's actually incredibly difficult to do, I'll be honest with you. The data especially are uh, large, they're complex. And uh, I think one thing that I would love to um, understand a bit more about your plans is that knowledge is rapidly advancing. So mm -hmm. when you tell somebody something, when we told somebody something five years ago, mm -hmm. and they maybe didn't have a diagnosis, they want to know when mm -hmm. we're going to look at it again. And, you know, this, this expectation management is, is a challenge too. But well, it's a great vision you've got, so I liked it a lot. So I learned is like what we heard from you in January, it's too old already, so that we have to, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> but secondly, that we should store data and maybe looking the data from the beginning, like a few months after or looking it from the, the other perspective is something that you think is uh, key. Well, I don't want to dominate the conversation. I think uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a medical doctor, but I think we, you have to be um, clear in your own minds and then be clear with participants and patients about what you are doing and what you're not doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way we've done that in Genomics England, I say we because I'm no longer there, but in Genomics England, I think one of the most successful things and something I'm doing uh, with colleagues in Ireland is actually getting patients involved in decision making about who has access, what the priorities are. So they are, they are not just, um, it's not just like a public relations exercise, they are actually part of the decision making committees. And you may want to have a look at that in Serbia. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Yeah. I uh, wanted to talk about you. You've been uh, in the Shanghai uh, Institute for, for uh, Medicine for since 1992, I guess. So can you share with us what are the, the current projects that you are working on and uh, um, you believe connect or can uh, be really beneficial for precision medicine and personal medicine? Uh, yeah, uh, so I was uh, recommended by uh, Dr. Marina Sokovic to come over and uh, to... Uh, this uh, conference. So when I see all the questions uh, where uh, Jelena has sent to me, I was uh, having a headache because uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm from the small molecule uh, world. You know, we are, we are making small molecular screening, uh, drug development, and uh, now we are talking about uh, you know uh, genetic medicine. But I think from the uh, from the experience I uh, had, uh, I think one thing is. Uh, uh, I mean, the gene screening is really helping a lot of uh, patients. I, I use my uh, mom as an example. Uh, uh, now it's also in China, really, uh, you have the annual health check. And uh, 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 my mama is at the age of 79. So 
So it's it's really critical because uh, after eighty, it's another you know uh, 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 kind of uh, judge. Uh, but uh, she's in the age of uh, uh, seventy nine and get uh, uh, you know really developing uh, breast cancer, and uh, I, I mean uh, left and right they are in different situation, and uh, the doctors are really very very careful. So uh, really uh, first operation on one knob, and then get the biopsy and the second uh, operation on the other. And then you know you, you have to go to the hospital two times and get all this uh, treatment. Um, you know, as a chemist, I was really like, why don't you just do it simple, just you know, treat it at the same time? But the, the I was talking to different doctors and they give me, okay, this is really an SOP coming from millions of patients. So we have to respect all these. Um, and even with all the genetic, you know, analysis, and you know, they do step by step. And I mean, uh, actually, my mom is really now in a very good uh, condition. And this is just one example, you know, how uh, genetic analysis is so important, I think, in every patient. Uh, and also, I, I was just talking to Mark. In, uh, in all my friends, there are many physicians, and they say, okay, with the current. Um, uh, Technology actually solid tumor in whatever organ for them it's not challenging. You know, it's in brain in you know everywhere, uh, even in the backbones. You know, they are, they have crowd of nerves. They, they they don't they don't care. They just can get rid of. The biggest challenge for the physicians is really the metastasis. Yeah, that's really something like uh, you spray it over and that's a nightmare. So this is actually. Uh, uh, Stimulate or like uh, the institution like us. Uh, we are coming from. Uh, you know, uh, this institute is uh, established in 1932, so it's 90 years uh, working on small molecules. And then they say it's it, there must be a way that uh, small molecules could help to stop the metastasis or even you know reverse that. So this is, I think, uh, currently uh, the real world. So um, and this is also uh, I, I think for us. Uh, we wouldn't be jobless, so it's still we have a lot of things to do to to to, to really uh, treat the patient, um, you know, properly. And this uh, also, uh, I think, started the answer of the uh, question uh, Jelena has just uh, arised. And uh, in 2015, uh, the Chinese Academy of Science, um, uh, it was a long time talk, you know, shall we do that or not? It's uh, the precision medicine. Program and that's the uh, first time actually in China, systematically uh, we are searching for uh, medicines, particularly in, uh, in the cancer area. And can we really find uh, uh, the new uh, small molecules with uh, really uh, uh, biomarkers and put these kind of indications? And uh, luckily, actually, after five years, actually uh, we have the first uh, drug in the market. It's, uh, it's the uh, I think the first drug in the uh, in a in a uh, small uh, 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 non small cell cancer uh, this line, and we had also a biomarker, and uh, uh, I think that this is uh, I think a periodical kind of success for this whole program, and uh, uh, I, I think we are still going on, and uh, we are trying to uh, grow from. Uh, like cancer area to other areas like uh, CNS or uh, cardiovascular, which is, I, I think, even more challenging. But I think, uh, uh, I think for the more proper use and also to really have the uh, more precise medication for the patient, that's uh, something we have to do. Thank you. We'll go back uh, to uh, to you uh, later on with the with the. I'm really particularly interested in small molecules that you are working on for the um, traditional Chinese, um, but this is something. But maybe just a bit later, I just wanted to to, yeah, uh, sure. uh, to switch to, to my colleague uh, Branka and just to ask, um, first of all, Institute for Molecular Genetics and Genetic Engineering exists for 50 years in Serbia or so, and uh, um, currently you're working on several projects that actually contribute to the, the design and development of the Register of Genomics. Um, data. So I just want to uh, briefly present what are the current projects that you're working on and you uh, believe can contribute to the biotech and uh, the registry. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. 
Um, uh, one of our major projects is pharmacogenomics project, funded by European Union. It is an ongoing project, project already. So the main idea is to uh, sequence uh, the uh, people from Serbia and from Balkan region and to identify the most uh, frequent uh, drug uh, pharmacogenomic variant pairs to have a uh, panel for preemptive testing to, to suggest to uh, medical doctors which uh, before uh, treatment of certain drugs, which pharmacogenetics test can help them for decision making to treat patients at the, with the right drug at the right time to the right patients uh, according to individual genotype. So uh, this is not the end of the, the idea. Mm -hmm. The idea is to, to uh, put it into electronic format and to uh, help medical doctors through the whole region because they don't know what the codes means. So to help uh, better treatment of the patients. That's, that's one, uh, one of the projects. The other one is similar, is uh, about precision oncology. At the moment, we are doing uh, molecular co comprehensive genome profiling with non-small uh, cell lung carcinoma patients. This project is supported by Roche Company and we are trying to identify the, uh, which uh, molecular alterations are the most frequent in our patients to help uh, treatment-guided therapy for those patients. And also we are developing uh, uh, liquid biopsies to help uh, monitoring those patients. And, and the, the idea is to, to, uh, con to make this uh, disease a fatal disease uh, into a chronic disease and to help to give this test available to patients when, whenever relapse uh, comes. So uh, th that is very, very uh, interesting. And the, the, the other big thing that we are working on is um, uh, we are doing like a service for, f we introduced NGS sequencing in, in our institute 10 years ago. And we are doing a uh, uh, whole uh, clinical exome sequencing for the patients, and it is covered, covered by the uh, Serbian Health Insurance Fund. So it is available. There is a procedure. It is available for all patients that need this uh, intervention. So the, the doctors know uh, uh, if there is a genetic variant, if there is a drug for that, or Sometimes we confirm the, di the diagnosis, and from recently we are doing whole exome sequencing, uh, and the health insurance fund is is uh, covering that. And we have uh, already did uh, more than two thousand analyses in Serbia. Okay, we talked today about, and I, what I wanted is just to lay out what are the current projects you're working on and what are the. Um, the, the information that you can share about this. But uh, the topic uh, of, today's, uh, of today's conference is also the policies and what we can do to shape the policies in a way that we don't have these um, um, blocks when we are trying to do something. So for each one of you, I think from different perspectives, uh, please let me know, tell us uh, what, what are the major policies that you, you worked on or you think you should work in order to enable, um, for you, Mr. Lee, like uh, the, 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 the better or the most, more efficient um, genomic sequencing or more people involved. Or um, we, we hear a lot about data, are they protected or not? I think it's particularly important for, for BGI and I just wanted to know, uh, are you working on these policies? How do you collaborate with the world regarding these policies and how do you protect the data? Okay, I would like to uh, answer your question from two aspects. First one that is about is uh, cost. So no matter genome in England, or no matter I mentioned the public health information, actually that is the cost of sequencing. Actually, we have to spend money on this public health project. 
and on the precision medicine to save the life of, of the people. And meanwhile, we can get the data and use the data for the basic research. So it is not only to put the research fund for the pure basic research. So this is the cost efficient way. So how to use this cost efficient way? That is need the policy mm -hmm. to support. That is how to share the standard, that set up the, the uh, know-how, the, the, the uh, knowledge mm -hmm. database, and the, so actually that is the policy need to support. And another part I have to say, uh, that is a need, for example, the biofold, the bioproc. In my understanding, this is the hub to set up this uh, local ecosystem to speed up the local uh, the research and the industrial development. However, how to make this uh, the real e e the, the, the building as the innovator, not only the real estate. Building is not a building. Building is the ecosystem. So behind this ecosystem, that is a policy. For example, I just can share something, BGI, what we are doing here in Serbia. So at first, I have to say that is uh, we come here with the uh, re respect because right now in BGI, our chief scientist who leading our R&D team, the name, his name is Radi, developed this sequencing technology. He was born in Serbia. He graduated from University of Belgrade. So we came here. That is because of this respect. We fully respect the local talent. So we set up our first step here to set up this R&D team. And another one that is we have, we come here because of this friendship, the trust. During the past several years, very difficult during the pandemic, we work together with the local partner fight against this pandemic. So we have this friendship, we have the trust. So with the respect, with the trust, we have the confidence to set up the R&D team to be here. So right now, we already have nearly 20 person here on the uh, algorithm development. So that is what uh, we are doing here. And how to support our strategy in Serbia, we set up a collaboration with the University of Belgrade. And our chief scientist, uh, Radi, set up the uh, fund that is a scholarship fund to support the local talent. And we set up the joint education program with University of Belgrade. So actually we hope from the governmental level can have some policy to support, to, 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 uh, to have put more support on this mm -hmm. kind of the friendship in the future. And also our R&D team here to do this algorithm development and work together and to access some local health data also needed a policy to support. So I think that is uh, from BJ our experience, that is what we have there and what you expect on the policy part. Thank you. Um, I would say the similar question for you, Mike, but yeah. uh, for the 100,000 genome project, what we learned is like uh, there were some uh, also uh, issues in sharing this data with um, health insurance uh, companies and, you know, so there were some other issues related. So not the ones that we would think immediately about, but some other maybe economical uh, mm. issues as well. But generally, what is the, the major policy or the approach that you used in in UK and now in Ireland in, in a sense of, you know, working with the with citizens, working? So what are the, the crucial uh, non-tech, non non-research things yeah. that you need to yeah. do in order to make things happen? Well, I think, I think it would, I would pick up on that point about trust. And I think going back to the early days and just after the Human Genome Project was announced, in the UK context, there's a lot of concern about insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And insurance companies are you know, quite widely used because if you buy a house or you take a big loan out, sometimes you're required to have insurance. So people were concerned that if genetic testing was rolled out more frequently, um, that they would have effectively uh, find it difficult to get insurance if they had uh, a condition. So in equally, insurance companies were not willing to say, uh, we don't mind, we won't have any genetic test data because they have a principle that if uh, a patient, if a, if, a, if a purchaser knows something, they should know the same information. And so we've had conversations with them about effectively recognizing the limitations on, on genetic information, the fact, and I'm sure you're doing the same thing, that you don't, it's, it's unethical to do a test if there's no cure. You know, so mm -hmm. it's unusual to do Huntington's tests unless you've got a family history, for example. 
So we, we were able to get a conversation going between scientists and ethicists, patients and the public and insurance companies that came up with a code of practice. And the code of practice is, is pretty much in favor of, um, of, the, of, the, of the buyer or the, or the, 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 the public, if you like, uh, because insurance companies can only use a very limited amount of information and only if they can prove that it would have a big impact on the whole market, not just at the individual price. So these, these conversations have taken decades, literally, and they've, but what they have done is they've, they've raised awareness between different groups. And, and you know, I've learned a lot about insurance, and I think insurers have learned a lot about um, uh, uh, genetics and genomics. And when we were doing the 100,000 Genomes Project, we applied the same sort of um, broad principles, not so much about consent, privacy, encryption, which I think are all absolutely vital, but also the concept around acceptable uses. So it was, it was uh, acceptable to have um, a, a, a vetted research project, whether it was from academics or from commercial companies. It didn't matter as long as it was a good project. But also commercial companies couldn't access data for say marketing purposes or for other reasons that were not in keeping with the, with the principles of the consent. So these, this concept of an acceptable and unacceptable use is applied also to the immigration services, the police, we basically uh, took a principle that nobody could use the data or access the data without a, a good reason lined up to, health, to the healthcare uh, uh, principles and research. In contrast, and you mentioned Ireland, I forgot to answer, Ireland's had a very interesting history um, in, a, in, a, in a negative way, if you like, because they have got pockets of excellence in, in the clinical service, they have pockets of excellence in laboratories, but no strategy. And then there was a company established called Genomic Medicine Ireland that decided it would invest in sequencing a population from, from uh, Ireland and various disease groups and make those data available for research. Unfortunately, because it was a commercial company with commercial uses, uh, there was a huge backlash politically and in public and on the media and so on. And so effectively that company became uh, extremely sort of toxic in a, in a public sense. And unfortunately it's had a knock-on effect to the where patients and public now feel about any genetic um, uh, uh, databases, if you like, in Ireland because of this kind of history. It's not to sort of criticise that company per se, but it just shows that if you don't connect it into government, connect it into other policies, connect it into trust frameworks, it can go, it can go wrong. So I'm, I'm, I'm all for commercial partnerships, but not just without recognising that ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe not focusing that much on the policy. I wanted to to ask uh, Mr. Mr. Young. You you talked. Uh, we talked about, and you said like uh, when you were younger, you were taking a lot of uh, um, uh, traditional Chinese uh, um, drugs or, or medicines, and with no scientific proof of uh, how they actually work. So you kind of dedicated um, your your projects now um, to to work on this. Can you just give us a, a brief information? Yes, uh, I think Janina, the, uh, the, the, I think the first part I want to to share with uh, all the audience is, uh, you know, we, we more or less we passed this uh, COVID, and uh, everyone was thinking about you know what we can learn from this outbreak, and I, I think our institute is, is uh, trying a lot is to uh, to really persuade the government to invest money in the preparation of a series of candidates. Uh, through the existing uh, virus we have and uh, to be prepared for the, uh, the, the outbreak of a new accidentally the, the viral infection. And uh, what we want is to have really a series of uh, uh, candidates uh, in phase one clinical trials. So uh, later on, you know, whenever there's an outbreak and uh, we can use all these candidates and to, to, to do. And the last three years actually, we uh, invented the two drugs, uh, uh, primarily uh, one is focus on, focusing on the uh, 3CL, this uh, protease, the main protease of the uh, COVID-19, and the other is RDRP, the second uh, uh, very important target. And we have these two uh, uh, drugs already on the market. And uh, I think uh, this is something what we learned is not only the scientists, I mean, three years, two drugs, that's really uh, we are extremely empowered to do that, and I think uh, still we are successful. But on the other hand, we learn also from the administrative, you know, uh, at least the Chinese system is not really uh, ad adapted to the, you know, the fast tracking of all these uh, uh, to approve these uh, candidates to be used in humans. So this is, I think, uh, I want to share with all of us, and we 
need to be prepared. The second is uh, we, uh, even in the outbreak of the uh, COVID-19, we were thinking about how uh, traditional medicine can be used. Actually, we hear a lot actually this morning the, uh, the resistance of the antibiotics and so on. But I observe actually uh, my daughter, for example, from the, from the age she, she somehow, she can suffer from all this, you know, stinky brownish, this liquid from traditional herbal medicine up to she's going to the primary school. So uh, we had a, like a family doctor is a very elderly, uh, you know, traditional medicine doctor. And she prescribed exactly, precisely the uh, prescription for my daughter when she has a, a cold. So that means the traditional medicine, they have their theory. They, they are not really just randomly give you something. Rather, they are combining all the different recipes, classical recipes. And the, this kind of traditional knowledge, I think, uh, I, I always ask the audience, you know, if I give you a, a, a glass of like hot water, but uh, you know, very stinky and also <laughs> brownish. You don't know what is there, but I tell you, okay, thousand years, the Chinese are drinking that. I, I will ask the young lady, do you want to drink it? Most <laughs> no. probably say, well, not. So this is something I think the, the gap we, we, we need to overcome. Mm -hmm. And also the traditional description, you know, they are, they are using like, uh, it's cold, uh, it, it's hot, you know, it's, uh, you know, they, the, 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 the gut uh, in the traditional description is not really the gut we have. So the, we have to really adapt the, the, the modern technology to all this kind of traditional knowledge to really shorten it. We are not really just to go to the forest to hunt something and just to isolate 100 compound to really randomly screen uh, if they are useful or not. Rather, we should follow the uh, traditional therapy and to really find the scientific, uh, you know, uh, reasons behind that. I think that will be for the personalized medicine more, maybe a, a sh shorter way. Okay. While we are talking about uh, personalized medicine and precision medicine uh, and scientific evidence of, uh, of some uh, molecules, I, I also wanted to, to ask Branka about the, the data and the scientific evidence, data, genetic data, the health data, how it can be used and what do you believe it's going to be the, the, the use of this data in medicine? Yeah, it's not important only to have genetic data on the, of, the, of the patients. You, can, you have to, uh, to have both genetic and health data to help the patients. So we became aware that with uh, this big data, we don't have a place to store that uh, much information and the uh, Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution and uh, the, the government recognized it was the perfect timing for us. And uh, uh, they enabled us to uh, use the um, uh, government resources from uh, National Data Center in Kragujevac. So we, we are now safe and data will, uh, will be stored in a proper way with the most uh, efficient um, uh, security measures. Mm -hmm. So uh, with this kind of data, if they are stored proper, properly and uh, you can use them again in a, in, a, in a manner that you can search something, that you can later check on something, uh, you can use bioinformatics and IE tools, artificial intelligence tools to, to help you uh, 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 that recognize these patterns uh, that, that humans can't do. So this intersection of biology mm -hmm. and informatics and bioinformatics and, and artificial intelligence, and we heard about uh, machine learning and black boxes this morning. So uh, this could help us to real use the data, to, to, to have the uh, biomarkers or genetic variants as biomarkers to help uh, to, to give the patients timely diagnose and uh, treatment according to uh, personalized treatment. So I think the most valuable thing should be for the patients to get timely diagnose and access to the test they need and to help medical doctors 
to, uh, to help them uh, to make decisions for the patient faster. Okay, for, so we talked about the current projects, where we, where we are. We talked about policies and how we can contribute with policies to, to stimulate uh, research, genomic data, health data, and what can we do about it. And just for the end of this uh, panel, I need a message from you. So uh, we are looking, you know, so I'm coming from the Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution, I'm looking at the fifth one, so I'm interested uh, to hear from you to share what do you think is the next big thing in biotech and genetic data and uh, how can we be ready all of us not 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 only Serbia so what is the next big thing in biotech or genetic data so actually I, I understand your your question but actually I truly want to say some real things that okay. in Serbia and the BGI how we can thinking to set up the value chain because mm -hmm. That is also the part of the answer for your questions, because uh, we fully respect the uh, education quality in Serbia that is the joint in the world. And uh, we also fully respect the algorithm, the software, the development, uh, the technology here. So to be honest, we have the confidence in Serbia. Sooner or later, we can generate this uh, global, the first class companies and the technology. But to be honest, Serbia is not a big country can have enough the domestic market to support these uh, uh, startup companies. So BGI will come here, we hope to set up this bridge. Introduce the Serbia top level talent with China big domestic market. And also there's a very good uh, opportunities actually that is in Hong Kong. Everyone know Hong Kong that is an international city and also Hong Kong is an international capital center. And in Hong Kong stock market there's a special policy we call that is a 18A. Actually that which means if the pharmaceutical companies for the precision medicine even though the product is still under the clinical trial can go public to be the listed company, to get the enough capital to support. So working together and set up this bridge between the uh, innovation talent in Serbia and uh, the international capital in Hong Kong and the big market in China. Actually, I think that is a big We would like to play the role and why we're here and what is our expectation in the future. So, so I got two points from you. It's collaboration. This yeah. is the next big thing that can move and change the biotech. And, and let's all go to Hong Kong. This is the second. <laughs> 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 Just joking a bit, but thank you. Uh, good messages, uh, Mr. Bale. What about you? I'm 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 going to be the similar. Actually, I'm not going to say a technology because I've been in policy long enough to know mm -hmm. that you can never bet on these things. They come out of the out of the blue slightly. But what I would just pick up on is this sense of ecosystem, but I, I've, I've often called it a platform. And, uh, you know, the experience I've had in the UK of, of seeing small projects without enough evidence behind them to make a kind of system change versus a big national platform like the 100,000 Genomes Project. And then on top of that platform, you provide uh, opportunities for partnerships. You provide the ability to do additional investigations, connections, uh, for small companies to test out their, their software and so on. And we call them platform partners. Um, and I think picking up on Branka's point, one of the most interesting challenges that we faced in, in the UK was um, compute power, not storage, not security, not encryption, but compute power. When some scientists would come along and want to do something special to the, to the 50 or whatever thousand genomes, that compute cost alone was enormous. So we've gone to the commercial cloud in the UK, which is a difficulty for a lot of, uh, well, you have to explain this clearly to the, to the policymakers and the patients, but I think what it does allow us to do is to, is to stand up very rapidly some different compute resources and then make the person who wants to use that pay for it. You know, you can build that separately. So that's one thing I think is this platform allows us to do. And now, exactly, for example, they're, they're being able to connect digital pathology images to genome data quite quickly through this sort of method. Well, not quickly by the UK standards, but relatively fast, you know. So these sort of uh, ability to build a platform, and the analogy that I've always used is uh, we had a lot of resistance to setting up a big platform because a lot of individual 
uh, doctors and researchers wanted their own patients. And we would use the analogy of the, of the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, everybody admits it's a fantastic thing and you can do lots of research with the data, but you don't all need to have your own space telescope. You use the platform. The platform's the future. Thank you, perfect. Um, Mr. Ye? Uh, I think I want to uh, share with you three things. Warren is, I think, uh, uh, the collaboration from uh, other aspect. I mean, uh, uh, with University of Belgrade and our institute, we have a joint research laboratory. And uh, many uh, traditional Chinese medicine, actually, it's not Chinese. It's uh, from uh, Balkan area, because the Chen Zhe-san was here, and uh, he took a lot of medicines back uh, to China. So in a wrong place, uh, maybe a different uh, circumstances. So the, uh, the growing condition, everything is quite different. So what we want is to really do a comparison. So the plant here, the plant in China, and what's the difference and how to improve, how to uh, make a, a, a better quality of all these uh, medicinal plants to, to really to respect the, the history and the, uh, to make a further development. And I think for me, very important is interdisciplinary collaboration. I mean, uh, everyone's thinking about AI and when we are encountering the current problem, I mean, the machine now is really perfect. Uh, very precise uh, mass spectrometry, so they can really you you don't need the really you know the whole uh, uh, the organism you know you 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 need only one slice of the tissue, and then you can create enormous data, and what we want is really from this enormous data find the tracy clue, maybe the biomarker of the uh, cancer you know uh, whatever it is, uh, I think in UK they have really fantastic facility. The, the, the operation room is on the one side on the same floor and the, 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 the laboratory is on the other side of the same floor. So you, you can really transfer all this information very easily. But in, in China, we, we try to optimize it. But when we are encountering the, 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 um, the, the real uh, samples, then you, you really need uh, machine learning, you know, uh, AI, and to really help you to, uh, to, to, to pick up all the important information from this enormous amount of data. So this is, I think, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a real need. It's not just to superficially, we say, okay, uh, you, know, uh, you know, AI is so hot that somehow you have to go, but I think it's really a requirement and uh, that really needs the contribution from every aspect. I mean, I really hope, you know, not only China, uh, in Balkan, uh, everyone could uh, contribute and uh, really to realize the dream like we can really uh, 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 cut the cost and to, to really make a precision treatment for uh, individual uh, patients. I like your point actually on interdisciplinary approach because uh, last night I was talking uh, uh, with, with one of the people that are uh, giving lecture today and he said, do we need biologists at all? <laughs> a bit worried <laughs> and he's coming from the IT sector so so I was like thinking uh, the same but uh, this collaboration and this kind of we, we all picked collaboration and uh, joint joint work and sharing and inter interdisciplinary approach is uh, something that we all, all need in addition to what Mr. Bale said that we can use the same resources and rely on the joint resources um, to develop further. Branka what about you what is the next big thing in biotech? Uh, I have to fully agree with all the previous mm -hmm. conclusions because for me the keyword is also collaboration and knowledge sharing. And that's the only way we could move forward and to implement precision medicine in, in practice. So uh, the big next thing, I, I think it have to, to happen, it, that is intersection of un, uncompatible things like biology and IT sector. So I think we are expecting a big neck thing from, from, from that side. And for us in Serbia, I would say the Biofor is also the, big neck th the next big thing that uh, the whole uh, scientific community and health system and the whole that interdisciplinary teams can uh, benefit from. So we can't wait for that to happen. 
Thank you so much. I want to thank my panelists. Thank you all for being here with us the whole time and listening to us. Thank you so much. Again. <laughs>